three o'clock in the afternoon on the east coast of the United States, noon on the west coast, from which Susan Estrich joins us now. Susan is, of course, a former faculty member of Harvard Law School and the University of Southern California Law School, as well as a renowned trial lawyer in her own right. Uh, we were colleagues together many years ago, many times at Fox, and it's a joy to be working with her again. Susan, welcome back to the program. It's great to be here with you, Judge. Thank you. So last week when the indictment of uh, Donald Trump came out, uh, true to form to the New York system, which is a little alien to the way you and I were trained and the way we practice, it was just bare bones. In fact, you called it. I used your line many times later on in the day. Uh, chopped liver. <laughs> basically just An listed. insult to my mother, I should say, who made much better chopped liver than this. All this right. Well, the, like the, very the, low indictment, the indictment did little more than list the statutes that the government claims Trump violated. But following the New York form, the indictment was followed or New York procedure, I should say, the indictment was followed by a statement of facts sworn to by the district attorney himself. This is alien in some systems since he can't swear to the facts. I guess he was swearing to the existence of evidence, which in his view would substantiate these so-called facts. And they painted um, a picture of, in my view, Trump, Michael Cohen, and Alan Weisselberg, the now convicted and incarcerated former CFO of the Trump Organization, as having concocted a very, very sophisticated scheme uh, to avoid detection of the use of corporate funds uh, to pay um, Stormy Daniels, a woman named Susan McDougal, and a doorman, all of whom claimed they had knowledge uh, of Trump's untoward sexual behavior, which Trump uh, denied. The scheme was intended, as I read the statement of facts, and as you and I suspected, even from the indictment, to make it appear that Trump uh, had used corporate funds to pay a corporate legal debt, uh, where, as in reality, they were reimbursing Michael Cohen, they were compensating Michael Cohen, and then they were compensating him on top of the compensation to give him money with which to pay his taxes. It was a very sophisticated scheme. But here's where I think the DA was a step ahead of you and me and others when we thought that the so-called underlying crime would be a federal one. The DA found two state underlying crimes, the failure to pay New York state taxes on income which was really to pay a personal debt, not a corporate debt, and the failure to, and the use of corporate funds uh, to pay a campaign debt, which even though it's a federal campaign is a violation of New York state law. Okay, how do you see this? I see this as paying off your mistress, okay? As you say again, Susan? Around. As paying right. off what? Your mistress, you screwed around, you got caught, you're running in a campaign, you don't want your wife to know, you don't want the country to know, you turn around and you pay off two women. One, I guess, got paid $130,000. The other one got paid off $160,000. I have to tell you, Judge, in my book, I have to be honest, he got off kind of cheap. I paid off more. I hate to say it, but it's true. You know, Donald Trump, this is the word of a convicted felon, but if he did it with Michael Cohen, he should have gotten a better lawyer, should have had a better lawyer on the other side, should have drafted better papers, should have done it legally. But these are two bookkeeping offenses. I mean, come on. Is this the best you can do for the former president of the United States? Well, now, Susan, I mean, I'm that. the last person who should be defending Donald Trump, but you I, go I find that. somebody else. I know that but this, is, this is a legal this. analysis. You, you aren't seriously suggesting a different legal standard for him because he's the former president, are you? I don't know anybody else who's ever been prosecuted for this. Oh, there are many people in jail. 
in for, jail for keeping violations on for putting your pro for your, putting your former mistress down when you pay her off as a legal no expense. no no but for using corporate funds to pay a campaign debt or to use corporate well, funds if to you pay a, per use, a personal debt that's called income tax evasion well if you do it and you get caught on your taxes you pay your taxes off but you don't generally get charged with a 34 count felony for paying your taxes for putting down your your mistress as a tax Tax expense when you should if, report if it, it as, were if it were a one-off i would agree with you but this was but a one-off this no, was a two-off this was 30 this was 30. my god i'm defending donald trump to judge napolitano i mean this is the, this is the world this guy this is, is my world friend class history here this guy is my friend who inter interviewed me for the supreme court twice and i'm telling you there's a case here you're the liberal democrat and you're defending and i'm him. telling you this is the weakest case you could bring against donald trump he paid off his mis he had a lousy fix-it lawyer. Do I think Donald Trump sat down and was the one who came up with the scheme? He somebody said to him, Stormy Daniels is gonna cost you 130 grand. He said, pay it. These people did a lousy job. He had terrible fix-it lawyers. But do I think you indict the president of the United States for that? Uh, there you go again with a different standard for him. Well, if his I, name I were Donald, he, if his name were Donald Jones instead of Donald Trump, wouldn't have half of your sense. half of your argument goes away. Am I right? If his name were Donald Jones, they wouldn't have spent 18 months investigating this, looking into every detail of every payment he'd ever made in his life to see if they could find something somewhere under some hole that they could find that they could charge him with. I mean, seriously, Andrew, if this is were the worst thing Donald J. Trump had ever done in his life, you and I would be in a different business. We All right, really let's, would. I, I, I don't agree with you, but I love you, so I want to move on. Do you think that the Georgia case, as we understand it, is a stronger one against Much him? stronger. Uh, Much I'm stronger. Glad. I think the Georgia one is. I think the Washington one is. I think Mar-a-Lago is. I think the January 6th one is. I think they were all stronger than this one is. But I think if, if Alvin Bragg has convinced Andrew Napolitano that this is a sophisticated conspiratorial scheme, then maybe it's got more legs than I think it does. Because when I looked at this statement of facts, I have to tell you, I thought it was still pretty thin. I thought it was still a matter of an essentially personal scheme of a guy who was messed up in his personal life and screwed it up and had a bad fix-it lawyer and got a district attorney who was looking for anything he could possibly find under the sun and found something and used his discretion to go after it. But really, the more serious offenses were the other ones that were lurking for Donald Trump. And this one, he's using to political advantage. See, I see him as a notorious, well-known, boastful tax cheat. I'm going to hear about this uh, from a lot of our mutual friends who, who basically invited the DA uh, to look at his taxes. If he had paid this debt on a personal checking account and did not seek reimbursement for it from his corporation, no foul, no harm, no crime. It's because he used corporate funds. Now, he can claim it was to save my marriage rather than save the campaign. That takes the campaign issue that out of the it. legal so even issue away. Saving, even saving the marriage is a personal debt, yep. not a corporate one. Yep. There's always the tax issue, and you're right. There always is the tax issue. When I'm letting him off the hook or just saying the tax issue, pay your penalty, but that's not a felony, is it? It is. It is technically, yeah. but would you yeah, charge it? It, it, is, it is. You know, it's funny. You, you know this line from Clarence Darrow. Now, this is uh, 125 years ago. If a boy steals a dime, he's not going to go to jail. But if two boys conspire to steal a dime and then don't steal it, the government is going to prosecute them for conspiracy. Now, you're smiling. I smile. We all know the history of this. Uh, the fact that this was a conspiracy involving Donald Trump, Alan Weisselberg, and Michael uh, Cohen 
that and and that it involved 34 separate events. It wasn't a one off. Trump told his uh, his accountant, yeah, it was a corporate that don't worry about what it was. It was it was a regular, consistent, systematic 13 month series of 13 of 34 events concocted to uh, avoid taxes. That's what gets under their skin. Agreed or not? Oh, of course, that's true. But you got two convicted felons as the other two co-conspirators, and you got the former president of the United States. And if I'm a prosecutor and I've got a choice of which case is going to go first and where we're going to put the former president of the United States and ask him to answer for his crimes, I have to tell you, and I'll tell your listeners, that I'd look at January 6th, I'd look at the election, of 2020, I'd look at some of the other things that Donald Trump has been accused of at Mar-a-Lago and the presidential documents. And then I look at Stormy Daniels. And this is the last one, not the first one that so I take I agree, a look at. But look, this is this is different jurisdictions. I mean, the feds are going to charge when they're ready, and, and Georgia's going to charge when they it's will. ready. Yeah. I, I think, think the Georgia ready. one is coming very soon. I mean. Uh, it only takes two or three days for her to summarize before her grand jury what the other grand jury spent eight months investigating. And it appears that the feds are nearing the end of their I investigations. Hope so. I hope However, so. uh, about 15 minutes ago, um, Trump's lawyers filed an appeal uh, before the full D.C. Circuit on whether or not former Vice President Mike Pence has to testify. The circuit ruled 3 nothing that he does have to testify. He's not testify. about what he did on the floor of the House. They're giving him the speech and debate clause protection there, saying it was as if he were a member of Congress there, but about what Trump whispered in his ear on the days and hours and minutes leading up to his uh, presiding over the joint session of Congress. He agreed not to, he said he's not going to appeal it. He was scheduled to testify this week. He may still testify this week because Trump is purporting to intervene in the case uh, and file an appeal, even though Pence said he doesn't want to file the appeal. He wants to uh, testify. What would you do if you were the judge on that one, Judge? I would have said that tr Trump doesn't have standing. They already ruled on uh, um on executive privilege. He's lost every single executive He's privilege. Going to lose this one too. Because executive privilege, as you remember from US v. Nixon, when it is confronting a criminal investigation, only applies to military secrets, diplomatic secrets, and sensitive national security secrets. That's US v. Nixon, written by Chief Justice Berger. It doesn't apply to everything that came out of the president's mouth wow. or went into his ear. That's right. I mean, I feel sorry for presidents because they think. They should be able to get free advice or, or freely given, I should say, advice from people uh, whose advice they they value. Uh, but some of it uh, can be exposed, uh, particularly when it's the same branch of the government. It's the executive branch. You know, executive privilege protects you from the legislature. I don't know that it protects you Steve, from, from prosecutors who used to work for you. Nope, I don't think it does. Quite a week we have ahead. Yeah, we do. Stay we tuned. Do. So, so I, you know, I, I've never practiced in California. I practiced in the federal system. I was a judge in the New Jersey system. Uh, I would imagine California is similar to New Jersey and the feds where they give you all the evidence. New York, this goes back to the Cardozo years, Susan. Um, New York, you have to pull teeth to get all the evidence from the DA. You have yeah. to file all these motions and force the judge to make all these yeah. rulings. And it's it's an old fashioned way for the defendant to get the uh, to get the evidence. But that's what uh, that's Joe what Tacopina and company, Trump's current uh, uh, trial lawyers, are going to have to go through. That's what they're going to get through. And that's what they're going to get. It'll be interesting to see. Right, right, right. What are you up to later? What are you what are you talking about in your podcast, my dear? But am I talking about my podcast? Oh, the war in Ukraine, what's going on in the world? Well, we do the same. Um, in 15 minutes, uh, I have uh, Phil Giraldi. He's the uh, former CIA official who told George W. Bush that Saddam Hussein has no weapons of mass destruction. 
and Bush threw him out of the Oval Office and announced to the country within hours that we were going to invade um, Afghan um, uh, Iraq because Saddam Hussein did have weapons of mass destruction. So Phil is an iconoclast, and he will be opining on the latest document dump, uh, which was leaked from the Pentagon on Good Friday. Admiral Kirby, the spokesperson for the National Security Council, says that they do not, they cannot rest assured that this is the last of the dump. I wonder if they have reason to believe that whoever the thief is, he or she is about to reveal more. Well, the question is, is it a leak or is it a, is it a dump? Is it a leak? Are they, these documents being destroyed? Are they being, you know, sensitized? This is an amazing story you've got on your hands. It is. It is an amazing story. And it, it's reminiscent. You and I remember these days uh, of the Pentagon Papers. You know, right. when those Pentagon right. Papers came out, uh, what did, uh, you know, Nixon did his his uh, his best to suppress them. The Supreme Court said, no, doesn't matter how the media got them. Uh, the public has the right to know. There's still the thief there. The thief can be prosecuted. Ellsberg was prosecuted. The prosecution was dismissed because of FBI misconduct, which I doubt would be re, uh, repeated here. But the public will still see all of this. Right. Uh, the former... CIA agent Ray McGovern, who analyzed this stuff for us this morning, said it was pieces of paper, like somebody folded it in their pocket, took it home, opened, right. it, opened it up, and took photographs. Right, right. That's what I was reading about in the press this morning. Well, we'll see. We'll see where all of it goes. Susan, it's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to be. Thank with you, you for your honor. insight. When when the Georgia indictment drops, as it will, and when the two federal indictments drop, as they will. We will call you first. Okay. I'll be glad to join you. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you. More as we get it, my friends. Uh, Phil Giraldi at 3.30 Eastern on uh, who and how did all of this information about the United States uh, Pentagon lying to the public come out on Good Friday? More as we get it. Judge Napolitano for judging freedom.